Hello. Happy that you all chose to join us again today. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come to say thank you. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for your word. We pray, Father, that you would open our hearts and minds to receive you afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are continuing on article number 11, the perseverance of saints. Our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure unto the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And our main scripture continues to be John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32, which reads, To the Jews who have believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And our focus continues to be on the latter part of verse 32, and the truth will set you free. And we'll continue our on our third declaration of freedom, which is freedom from discouragement, no frustration. And it's found in Romans the 8th chapter, verses 18 through 30. But again today, I will read verses 28 through 30 out of the NIV. It reads, And we know that in all things God worked for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. And so we've said that one of the assurances of God is that he works things out for those who love him. God will overrule and work even through the tragedies caused by sin's presence in the world to accomplish his purposes in the lives of those who love him and who has responded to his call. We said that that, that should encourage us and give us comfort during difficult times. And, and that's a great assurance. But as good as the promise is, there is a but. There is a condition. God works all things out for good only to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. The promise is not for everybody. It can be if everybody loved God, but that is not the case. God only looks after the affairs of the person who loves him. If a person turns his back and walk away from God, how can God look after that person? God is not going to force his care on any of us. He's not going to make mechanical robots out of us and force us to live at his beck and call. That's not love. We must choose to love God not be made to do so. God wants love that flows from a heart that chooses to love him. The amazing thing is that God has chosen to love us. He is always waiting with arms open wide to receive us. Remember last time I said that we would leave the main road and take what I call the scenic route. Uh, so right now, just imagine us turning off the main road to explore how much the Father loves us in, in, in John 3.16. But remember, after the, the scenic route, we will return to the main highway uh, at a future date. So the message version of John 3.16 says, this is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why. So that no one need to be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone 
can have a whole and lasting life. God, who is love, actively demonstrated his love through Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. And through him, he offered salvation to all mankind. Think about that. God loved the whole world. For some, that's a shocking statement. Especially when you consider what is meant by the whole world. God loves everybody. Every person. Not just the good upstanding religious folk. God loves the despicable. He loves the murderer, the immoral person, the bitter person, the vengeful, the wife beater, the child abuser, the prostitute, the thief, the alcoholic, the street person, the oppressor, the person who had, who, who've had an abortion, the person who performed the abortion. God loves the unloving, the unlovable the stubborn, the selfish, the greedy, the spiteful, the vengeful, the believer, and the unbeliever. He loves you and he loves me. And the list could go on and on and on. God's love is not based on us loving him. The basis of God's love is his nature. God is love. Therefore, he loves. He acts love. He demonstrates love. And he shows his love. Again, the message version of John 3, 16 says, This is how much God loved the world. He gave his only son. And this is why so that no one need to be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. Before diving into the verse, um, let's take a look at the context of the verse by looking at the verses above it, verses 1 through 15. I won't read it, but I would encourage you to read it. In fact, You can pause me right now, get your Bible, and read it. Then you can unpause me and continue listening. That's the beauty of a recording. You are in control. You can hit play, you can hit pause, you can hit replay, and you can listen as often as you like. One out of all the the bads of the COVID experience, that's a plus for our virtual worshiping uh, during this period of COVID-19. John 3.16 takes place at night in a conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, who was a Jewish religious leader. He waited until most folk were probably in bed so that he could catch Jesus by himself. When I really thought about that and considered the crowds that followed Jesus and how busy Jesus was, one would wonder how it was even possible for Nicodemus to find a time when nobody was with Jesus. And when I thought about that, I thought, Just doing that would be a task all by itself. So I believe that unbeknown to Nicodemus, Jesus was waiting on him for him to have that time alone with Jesus. He had to desire it, but Jesus had to make it happen. Then he didn't just come for himself. He came in behalf of the religious group that he was part of. They had obviously been talking about and wondering who Jesus was. When when he approached Jesus, remember he said, Rabbi, we know, meaning that they've been talking. 
some some of the religious leaders were wondering if Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was the talk of the town. I mean, everybody was talking about him. Think about it. He's doing miracles and, and, and all kinds of things. So the word got around. So everybody was talking about Jesus. Everybody was wondering who he was. Was he truly the Messiah? And so since he was performing all kinds of spectacular works, uh, they, they just couldn't imagine just a, a, a person doing this and, and not be the Messiah. So everybody wanted to know if Jesus was the Messiah. This was the question, the tension, the thing that compelled Nicodemus to want to find out. So he, fearing the other leaders who opposed Jesus, came at night seeking answers. Note that he, he, he only acknowledged Jesus as a teacher from God. He and the folk he had been talking to knew that only a man from God could do the miracles that Jesus was doing. In, in essence, Nicodemus was asking Jesus, just who are you? The miracles show that God is with you. But the tension felt was because Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah, the Son of God. And Nicodemus wanted to know, are you really the Messiah? Now Jesus, being Jesus, saw through the heart of Nicodemus. He saw that he was searching. And that's the amazing thing about Christ. The, the heart that searches for him, he will allow himself to be found. If you look for him, you will find him. I, I am always amazed at the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. While Nicodemus is trying to be tactful, you know how we do, trying to ease into the conversation, Jesus goes straight to the heart of the matter. Miracles and signs were not the important thing. And Jesus was not going to be entangled or waste time chit-chatting with Nicodemus. Nicodemus appears to be investigating Jesus' identity. But the reality was that he was in need of a savior. He needed to be changed, changed spiritually, changed on the inside. He needed to be changed completely. He needed to be born again. And Jesus tells him, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that statement, to be born again, just messed Nicodemus up because he was thinking physical and Jesus was speaking spiritual matters. Think about who Nicodemus was. Think about the kind of life that he had lived and how he was used to relating to God. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He, he was used to relating to God through religious works. The Pharisees was a religious party that had a firm grip on the law. <clears throat> Their supreme aim was to strictly follow both the written and the oral law. <coughs> Excuse me. Even though they looked down on common people, the, the, the common people admired them, thinking of them as representing the ideal followers of the law. Can you imagine how confusing Jesus' statement must have been to Nicodemus. Jesus answered him and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Which, y'all, that just totally messed Nicodemus up. So, so Jesus explained the experience of the new birth, which only confuse him more. Then Jesus asked Nicodemus, 
it, it's almost like Jesus was taunting with him. He was like, are you the master of Israel and don't know these things? Jesus was speaking to a Pharisee who would have been well-educated, well-trained, and the presumption would, be, would have been that he was a righteous man. And Jesus, in essence, told Nicodemus, all those years you spent progressing in Judaism, all that time he had spent reciting prayers and participating in religious festivals, accounted for nothing as it related to the kingdom of God. All that stuff may have laid a foundation for truth, but all of his knowledge of the law didn't have the strength to save him. Then Jesus reached back into the Old Testament to further explain this point. In verse 14, Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So Jesus illustrated his point by using the Old Testament story of Moses lifting up the bronze serpent in the wilderness. And that's found in Numbers 21. But Nicodemus would have been very familiar with this story. The, the children of Israel had been doing what they do, murmur, complain, grumble. Uh, uh, they would grumble about um, what they had but didn't want. They would grumble about what they wanted but didn't have. Sounds like us. <laughs> They, they, they complain about being in the wilderness and wishing they were back in Egypt. And if you remember, when they were back in Egypt, they were wishing they were out of Egypt. These folk even complained about the manna that God had provided for them and called it worthless bread. Most of us can recognize this grumbling spirit in our children. It's easy to see it in our children. It's easy to see it in somebody else. But the reality is that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. We are all guilty. And we can all thank God for his grace and his mercy. Well, back to Israel, humanly speaking, God was fed up with these folk and punished them by sending fiery serpents among the folk. And, and, and the serpents would bite them. And, and, and many of the people, once they were bitten by the serpents, they died. Uh, then they, they, they repented and, and begged Moses to pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from them. And, and the Lord knows what it takes. Uh, to get our attention. He knows what it takes for us as individuals and he knows what it takes for us as a nation. So to receive healing, if they once they got bitten, they had to look at a bronze snake that had been lifted up on a pole. And looking, when you think about it, looking at the snake on the pole, was an act of faith. When they looked up, they were healed by God. This was the only way that they could be saved from this certain death because had they not looked up, they would have certainly died. This was Israel's pattern from the time they left Egypt and throughout the whole Testament. They would rebel then the Lord's judgment would come on them. Then Moses or whoever was their leader at the time would intercede on their behalf and the Lord would show mercy. They were no different during Jesus' earthly days. They were still rebelling. And <clears throat> surprisingly so, it's no different during our days. But this time, 
there was and is a different intercessor. We, we no longer have to look up at a bronze, uh, uh, a bronze snake on a pole. This time, Jesus was the one whom the Lord would lift up and grant mercy. The brazen serpent was lifted up, was like the poison that was lifted up, was like the poisonous snakes, but without the sting. Christ lifted up on the cross was like man, but without sin. So, so God is demonstrating how much he loves us. But we are out of time for right now. That's all of our time. So join us next week as we continue our scenic route, looking at how much we are loved by the Father. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we say thank you. Thank you that you love us so much. Thank you that your arms are always open wide for us to receive us. Father, we just say thank you. Thank you for grace. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for being God. As always, we ask that you would show us what to do with what we've heard and give us the courage to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, everybody, that is it for now. Join us again uh, next week, and we will continue in our lesson. Bye-bye. Love you. Be safe.